teachers are without students and those of you who are students are without teachers. So I'm hoping with uh, these chats that we can sort of help mitigate that a little bit. Um, I think a time like this where you are alone with your instrument can be extraordinarily beneficial, uh, but certainly it can also be difficult. Uh, so many people are not used to working without regular lessons. Um, I think online lessons are certainly going to help that, and I hope that these cello chats, I think you saw that uh, Cello Bello is going to try and have actually daily cello chats. Um, if there's not enough call for that, we might spread that out a little bit, but there's so much goodwill from the cello community uh, from all over the world. Uh, people have been offering to give these chats. So we scrambled and set up this first week of chats. And um, if you go to cello, cellobello.org slash chat, it will take you to the page where you can see the schedule. Uh, the majority of the chats are at this hour, uh, one o'clock Eastern time here in Boston. Uh, that means if you're out in California, hopefully 10 a.m. is not too early for you. Um, even if you sleep in, you can grab a cup of coffee and be there for a 10 o'clock chat. And uh, if you are in Europe, it's now, I think it's only a five hour time change to Europe, a four hour time change to England and a five hour time change to Europe because uh, the United States went on uh, daylight savings time. So uh, unfortunately we don't have any, <laughs> there's no possible time um, where we can get everybody on earth. We have a lot of Asian listeners that are probably asleep at this hour but we will have chats scheduled uh, in the evening U.S. time so that people in Asia will be able to join. So that's what's on our thinking. Um, uh, Peishan, let me know when, if there are people online and if there are any questions. Um, yes, we have uh, the numbers keep going up. Oh, okay. So, well, that's a good sign. <laughs> almost 80 people watching. Oh my gosh. Hello, 80 people. <laughs> yeah, we have our first couple of questions already. Sure. Yeah. So this is from Larissa. Uh, the question is, how would you recommend practicing so that when you're under stress, performing your intonation doesn't start going, you don't tense up, etc.? Oh. So it feels like there might be a few questions in that question. Um, so if I understood it, how do you practice so that, oh, because you're under stress and you might tense up. Is that, uh, yeah, I love that question because as my students uh, will probably tell you, I drive them crazy <laughs> about the importance of keeping muscles loose. Um, it's actually a wonderful time to deal with this because when we go out on stage, we also are under stress and we also tend to tense up. So um, there's lots of parts to that answer. I think the maybe the most important part of that is you have to tune in to your body. What does your body feel like? Um, and if you're stressed, are you breathing? Uh, and uh, breathing and particularly exhaling, just try it while you're listening to me now. If everybody just takes a breath and blows it out, you feel your body loosen, right? This is something that has gotten me through several thousand concerts in my life. Uh, when I was younger, I was, uh, got very nervous on stage. And when I realized the power of the exhale, um, that became incredibly helpful. And what I found for myself is that uh, 
even after I knew that letting my breath out would help my muscles to relax and help my, my arms and my body to feel healthier and better and allow me to play the cello better. Uh, when I was out on stage, uh, it was hard to do, you know, because when we get nervous, we hold our breath. So when we're at home right now and we're stressed out about the world situation and uh, what might be outside of our window, we also get stressed and we tend probably, uh, I imagine, uh, Larissa, that's what you're thinking about. Uh, we can walk around a lot of the day like that. So what I suggest to all my students, even in more relaxed times, is that when you practice, you practice consciously exhaling. Um, you don't have to, th my, one of my early teachers always told me, breathe, Paul, breathe, Paul. And so I would breathe, I would go, and then I would just hold it in. And then I thought, oh, I'm supposed to breathe. And I'd take another big gulp, right? So in a way, uh, that gave me some oxygen, but it didn't really loosen my muscles because when you take a big breath and you're holding on like that, of course, things are just getting tighter and tighter until you take your next breath. But if you go and exhale, you will never forget to go to pull your air back in. So let's say you're playing a popper etude and you come to the end of a phrase, just practice making yourself blow your air out, go on to the next phrase, I think the easiest time to do it is wherever there's a musical point. You know, you can also imagine yourself a wind player. Where would I breathe? And when you're trying to teach yourself this technique, put a little breath mark or a comma in your music so that every time you come to that spot, you train yourself to let go. After a while, it gets quite, um, quite automatic. And I found that it even trans translated for me into my regular life. If I'm walking down the street and I'm feeling stressed about something or I'm on the phone and I'm talking to somebody and there's a lot of tension in the phone call, I just almost at a subconscious level, I'll just blow my air out and it always makes me feel better. Um, I talked for a long, does that sort of, sort of answer the question? Yes. yes, yeah. yes? Okay, uh, the next question is from Charlie. Uh, is it frowned upon for bow holds to have that black spot where fingers touch the hair? I've seen it, I've seen perfectly clean bow hairs. Oh, <laughs> listen, there's coronavirus out there. Wash your hands with soap and water. <laughs> and if your bow hair is getting black, just wash more frequently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> that black on the bow hair is dirt. That's all it is, and it comes, you know. Um, so, of course, in uh, a normal environment, uh, maybe we don't always wash our hands before we play our instrument. Um, but that's what it's that's what it's from. So, in terms of a bow grip. You might also think about where you are holding your bow. If you're too far down like this and your hand finger is right on the hair, uh, it's going to get dirty or fa dirty faster. There's a, sorry, I'm going to plug cello bello from time to time. Uh, be uh, unforgiving about that. But there are, I think, some really useful lessons about healthy ways to hold the bow. Uh, the idea is when you hold the, you pick up a glass and you hold the glass like this and you turn it around and you look at it, you'll see that the way you are holding that glass of water is with the pads of your fingers. Um, so you don't hold the glass like that, right? Because you don't have as good control of it. So when you're, and I could give you any object and that's, uh, uh, how you would hold it. So think of the cello bow the same way 
try and have your pads on the frog, not hanging off the, I hope you can see all of these things. Tell me, Peshawn, if they're bad. Yeah. Uh, but you don't want your fingers drooping down too far like this because you uh, don't move. really have control of the stick that way. Move to the, yeah, there. Ah, mm -hmm. okay, is that better? Yes. Yeah, so everybody's fingers are different lengths, um, but I'm near the hair, but I'm not on the hair because I'm on the frog. Um, hope that's helpful. We can pursue that more. If there are other questions about bow hold, we can uh, certainly do that. But mm -hmm. um, just to go back to my original point, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water. <laughs> uh, okay, actually the next question is related a little bit uh, by from Nira. Any exercises when dealing with tension in a bow hold? Also in the bow hold, does your thumb meet your middle finger or your ring finger? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, that's another excellent question. Um, and definitely related. So, one of my early teachers said to me, and I repeat it over and over, it stuck somehow. Oh, I know who the teacher was. It was Janusz Starker who said it to me. Uh, and uh, he said, if something feels tight, move it. I thought that was like, that helped me so much. So if you're holding the bow and it feels tight, move your fingers, you know, uh, you have to release in order to move. So um, to combine the last two questions together, if you can get comfortable with a bow grip where you can bend and straighten your fingers, move your fingers around, even do things like this so that you're not frozen in one spot. See, in order for me to do this, my thumb can't be squeezing too much. If I squeeze the bow, now I can't do this. So this kind of thing teaches you how to balance the bow in your hand, gives you control of it. So um, I like to say you want to feel like your boss. You can do anything with this bow you want to. You can swing it all over the place. Now, please don't do this unless you've got a carpet underneath you. <laughs> I don't want anybody sending me a nasty email saying they dropped their bow and broke it. <laughs> so, but flexibility of the bow grip will give you control over your bow hold and it will give you control over your bow. So when you do this stuff enough, you begin to feel like the bow is just an extension of your arm. Here's another exercise that I have people do where you're just crawling out on the bow and crawling back on the bow, moving it around like this, you see, so that you really have control to do basically any crazy thing that you want, right? Uh, now there was another part of that question about the ring finger or? Uh, yes. Uh, in a bow hold, does your thumb meet your middle finger or your ring finger? Ah, okay. Yes, so I have this little story that uh, I learned and I don't know where it first came from. <laughs> so my students are probably saying, oh no, he's not going to tell that one again. But anyway, <laughs> I like to say, pretend the bow is a ship and this is your crew, okay? Um, I'm getting to the thumb and the ring finger, believe me. So and this is your crew. So this guy is the first mate on the ship. He just lays out on deck. He's fat and he's lazy and he just lays there. Can you, is my bow in the picture? Yeah. And he just lays there and tries to do nothing at all. So I say that so that you're not squeezing or pressing down too much with that finger. And I say he's fat and lazy so that you feel your arm weight makes him heavy, right? Which is different than squeezing and being active. Okay, this guy, now we're getting to your question. This guy right here, he's friends with the captain. He, this is Captain Thumb. Sorry, I forgot to tell you, Captain Thumb. Captain Thumb does as little as possible he just sits below deck in his cabin um, 
and does as little as possible all day. And this guy right here, I hope this is all clear on the video, this guy is friends with the captain they like to visit. So I really don't like to tell people exactly where to put their fingers because some people are, have long fingers, some people have short fingers, some people have a, a long thumb, and a long or a short thumb is really important because a person with a long thumb, the rest of their hand can go out further than a person with a short thumb. But the idea is, anyway, that this guy visits with the captain, so they can even touch right together there. Then this is the first mate, heavy sitting there. Now it gets really corny. You ask about the ring finger. The ring finger, he likes to look out of the porthole. <laughs> so the mother of pearl is the porthole, right? Um, and I don't mean by that that he should be necessarily on the porthole, just in the vicinity of that little mother of pearl, wherever your hand falls naturally, somewhere around there. So I hope that's helpful. The one other thing I would say that helps you in terms of a healthy bow grip, or one of the other things, is if you, everybody just take their hand and let it drop like this. So notice my wrist is bent and I'm completely loose. When you do that, you'll see a spacing between your fingers. That spacing is the natural spacing of your hand, right? So it's not out like this, which creates tension, and it's not together like this, which makes your hand weak. So just let your hand hang out like this, and then put the bow in approximately there with the thumb, Captain Thumb visiting with his friend, the first mate being out here in the index finger, and the other guy looking under the porthole. I hope that gives you uh, some help in, in finding your own bow grip. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, there are a lot of other questions. Okay, yeah. I'll try not to be so long-winded. Yeah. Uh, so the next one is from Megan Hagel. Hello, what specific cello goals are you setting for yourself or recommend other cellists set during this time where there aren't really performances to work towards? Yeah, that's, uh, I appreciate that question That's because that's pretty much on the, uh, the topic that was announced for today, although I'm happy to go in absolutely any direction. But I, I'm, I'm concerned for all of you out there as you sit in the you know, confines of your home or apartment or wherever you are, that um, while it's a great time in theory to be productive, uh, it's also a difficult time psychologically. And I love the phrasing of that question because the word goals was in there. And I think in general that uh, productive practicing, good practicing, uh, needs to have goals. Um, that's why um, if, if you are in pursuit of something, um, that's really helpful. So I like to talk about short-term goals and long-term goals. Um, you know, the long-term goal is to be able to play like Yo-Yo Ma. <laughs> And the short-term goal is to find something today in the next hour or in the next two hours that you can improve upon, that you can fix. Maybe it's something that's evolutionary. Maybe you can't fix it 100%. But you find something in your playing or something in a piece of music Maybe, you know, it's just the ricochet, ricochet section in the Dvorak Concerto, um, or any difficult passage. Maybe it's uh, Piatti Caprice or Papa Etude number nine or something. Uh, you say, okay, for the next hour, I'm going to work on this Papa Etude and have some kind of an idea what you want to accomplish. You could say, Oh, this thing is really hard, I think. What's important is you don't want to bite off so much that you set yourself up for failure. So 
So let's say, okay, I just want to practice popper number nine down to the first fermata. I don't have the music in front of me, but that's like three or four lines. And then you work on that. And um, if you're lucky and you master that a little quicker than you thought, you can go on to something else. Or you might say, and this, I, I love this kind of thing as a goal. Um, you know, my teacher has been talking to me about changing the angle of my finger, the way instead of playing like this, I should be playing more like this. Or maybe um, my arm is too low, or maybe my arm is too high, or maybe I'm hunching. This is a really great time. Uh, where you don't have concerts to worry about, you don't have, at least for the time being, we don't have juries to worry about. Um, this is a time, a really beautiful time, to think about the, some of the really fundamental things, like those first questions about holding the bow were really important at a time like this, because this is a time where you can focus on that because you don't have a concert coming up. Uh, so it's really hard to think about physical changes or undoing a bad habit at a time that you're under stress uh, with a performance. Um, so I would, I would, inc I, I didn't answer that maybe as, as completely as I could, but to have little goals. So I guess the last thing I should say about that, and then we'll go on to another question, is. Especially, well, any time that we're practicing, it's nice to go away feeling good. The way we can go away from our practicing feeling good is to feel that we've accomplished something, right? When we sit there and practice for an hour or two hours and nothing changes, then we go away feeling frustrated. So I think we need to use the cello these days to feel good, <laughs> to feel better about ourselves, to feel better about the world. Uh, music really can be cathartic. Um, it's an emotional release, and this is something we all love and are attached to and can bond with. So it even helps with feelings of loneliness. But the point is, is that we want to have lots of little short-term goals that are important. They all add up and improve our playing. Um, but start every day knowing what you want to accomplish in a very concrete way. Another question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, this next question is from Gina. Uh, she said, hello. How should one warm up physically and on the instrument before digging into practice? And there's an earlier question from uh, Carol Pecker. Mm -hmm. She asks, will you address practice t techniques in isolation? Ah, okay. Yes, they're sort of re uh, related. <coughs> um, yeah, there's different kinds of warm-ups. I mean, I love uh, uh, my old teacher, uh, uh, Bernie Greenhouse, when he was talking about warming up for a concert. He would say, when I'm thinking of warming up for a concert, I don't call it warming up, I think I call it uh, cooling down. <laughs> I like that, because then we're nervous, and uh, we're dealing with the emotions, and we've got to go out and play, and so cooling down means softening the muscles, uh, bringing the pulse rate, the heart rate down, concentrating on breathing, all of those things. So that's one kind of warm-up. The kind of warm-up I think you're talking about is when you get up in the morning, um, and in a lot of parts of the country it's still pretty cold, and get out of bed and muscles are a little tight. And so I think of every time I come to the cello to sit down, and it doesn't take with experience, at least, it doesn't take a lot of time. I think of what, it's actually just actually what I was talking about before. You want to have a purpose for warming up. What is the goal of your warm up? 
what is the purpose of your warm-up and that can be a little bit different from day to day or it can be a little bit different in the morning than it is in the evening but the things that stay constant is you want to think of it as opening your ears you want to go to the cello and and listen and you will want to think of body awareness what does my body feel like you know what does the cello feel like you want to get in touch with because those are the things that are going to make you a better player when you start to work um, so you might get up at seven o'clock in the morning and say oh my god I'm so stiff so then when you come to the cello and you feel stiff so you might practice some vibrato just kind of loosening your joints up you know you might do some bow changes again getting your flexibility here not grabbing when we're you know when our muscles are tight we tend to grab more we tend to feel more like this when we get out of bed in the morning so getting soft what does the cello feel like you know you might come to the cello and oh, no that's my cello needs more weight my cello needs a slower bow those kinds of things are going to help you when you actually start to play your pieces then you might start with a this depends on your level of advancement or maybe it doesn't but when I warm up I try to open my ears to resonance I want to get as much glow and natural ring so I hope you I hope on the iPads and computers you can hear resonance in the room but there's uh, there there's a glow in the sound that means that I'm in tune first of all and it means that I've got a good contact point so I can kill that or I can not maximize it with my bow and if I'm out of tune doesn't ring the same way so that's you're sort of doing a lot of things at the same time you're opening your ears to intonation you're opening your ears to resonance which is intonation but it's also how to make a beautiful sound how to get the best sound out of your instrument um, you're softening your muscles so it's physical and oral awareness and that doesn't take too long and you play a few slow scales and just to see where the spacing is you might do some extensions and reach so that tells you that helps soften your hand as well and it also gets you in touch with the distances of the instrument um, another question yes Sure. Well, there are a couple of questions about vibrato and uh, stroke, but uh, since you just talk about intonation and resonance, I'm going to read you these two questions that, uh, you know, um, talk, asking about. Yeah. Sure. So one's from um, YouTube live stream. I'm finding that when I warm up with playing a few major thirds in first position, trying to get them in tune using just intonation, my cello actually sounds better. Is this just my imagination? No, it's not. It's a good question. It's a pretty advanced technical question. But um, yes, so uh, I shouldn't be demonstrating too, di too much today, folks, because I have not been playing the cello. I have to really be honest about that. But uh, if you take, he, he said first position. So if you find your G, and get it ringing and then you add a B okay so this is where you get the most resonance out of your instrument 
and that's what we call a just just intonation. That B is quite low. So, and it, look how far away it is from C. There's a lot of Bs that we would play. sounds okay in a scale, but it will sound too sharp in a chord. So I always plug my buddy's book, Cello Mind by Hans Jensen. It's a really wonderful book on intonation and the difference between melodic intonation and vertical intonation. We don't put notes in the same place uh, at, for melodies that we do in chords. Um, he explains it really well and it's all about resonance and uh, just uh, intonation versus tempered intonation versus intonation playing with the piano. We basically have three different approaches to intonation when you're playing at a high level. Um, I give a lecture on that, uh, I've done it for many years. It takes a minimum of an hour and a half, <laughs> and it could go longer than that. So I'm really not going to go there right now, but um, maybe at some point I can do a whole cello chat on intonation for those of you that are uh, advanced enough uh, for that. It's really hard to hear some of these things uh, online also, so that might do that for another time. But I hope that's helpful for right now. Uh, the just intonation for, which is what I call it, vertically aligned intonation when notes are struck together rather than following each other. Um, uh, that kind of a third sets up more overtones and that's what you're hearing on the instrument. So you've got a good ear and bravo for that. So the other question is from Matthew Smith. So, uh, thank you for this cello chat. How do you work on increasing resonance and projection? How do you maintain projection when performing and they become tight? Oh. Okay, well, resonance we've talked a fair amount uh, about so far today. I think everybody that plays the cello, you know, knows when your finger is exactly on the note, I call it the sweet spot, you get more ring. You know, if you're playing a G, it's exactly in tune with the G string, you get the G string vibrating. If you're playing a D, and it's in tune with your D string, you get the resonance. So you get extra resonance out of the instrument, which has so much to do with beauty of sound. And as your uh, question, I think, implies, it has to do with projection also. When you've got the whole instrument vibrating and ringing, you not only get a higher standard of intonation and a more beautiful sound, but fortunately you also have better projection, right? So um, the other part of uh, resonance has to do with your contact point. I, I think I was showing that before when you, Take a note like that, you can, you can kill the resonance. Or I like to think of the bow as exciting the resonance, so, not resonance, <laughs> resonance. Uh, so you find a bow speed and a contact point, and you're listening for the ring. Listening is everything. Your ears, when they dis when you get used to asking, when your ears get used to asking for resonance, and your ears cannot live without it. And that's sort of my state of being. I cannot stand to hear a sound on the cello which doesn't have ring in it. Um, that takes you a long ways towards projection. Now there's another part of your question which to me implied maybe a little bit of a problem. Uh, I think when you said something about projection, you said without getting tight. Um, so, I'm assuming that when you're trying to, I might be wrong about this, but uh, in terms of interpreting your question, but it sounds to me that when you're thinking about playing loud, uh, you start working and pushing down, right? 
Um, that kind of use of the muscle, pushing down here and tightening up your arm, and it could be anything. It could be hunching your shoulder and pushing down, you know. It could be squeezing your thumb to get power. That's sort of, uh, that's mis misunderstanding how we get the most power out of the instrument. The way we get the most power out of the instrument actually is, instead of that, it's to rest, to find a way to release these muscles. So, um, is the strings on the bridge in the picture? If it is, I hope you can see, if I rest on the cello, see how the, the bow goes deeper into the cello and the hair, the, the wood is now on the hair. This is without weight. This is, I'm going to exhale and feel heavy and actually feel like I'm resting on the instrument. That gets us deeper under the string than pushing down. Um, it's much healthier for the muscles and when we're, we're just as heavier, even heavier than when we're pushing, but it also leaves our arm soft and loose so we can be agile and virtuosic with our bow strokes. Um, so when you, you can practice something like exhale, release, see how heavy you can make your arm. Now, I hope you can see on the camera, look at my thumb. I just take my thumb away. This is, don't do this in concert. <laughs> but keep your weight in the bow and take your thumb away. It just proves that, now put your thumb back and just let it be very loose. Okay, so when your hand is over the strings, your thumb can be very loose. You don't have to grip at all. You might think you do, you might find it hard to let go, but actually that's why you can practice this, take your thumb on and off, right? Out here you will always need your thumb, and out here you really need your thumb because there's nothing underneath to hold it. But right here is, uh, if you do find yourself in concert getting fatigued, let's say you're very emotional and maybe your muscles are a little bit tighter than they should be, and let's say you have a long passage, you're playing Schnitka Sonata with four pages of Fortissimo, and if, you know, you, so whenever you come to the frog, just think about, just for an instant, right at the frog, loosening your thumb. So... I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but I took my thumb off the frog every time I changed the bow. Do it over a rug because, again, I don't want you to drop the bow. It, it's, it's, it's almost like a parlor trick. Once you get used to it, it's not hard. <laughs> okay. Well, there are a lot of people watching okay. yeah, from oh, all over good. the world. I'm seeing people from Australia, from Switzerland. Wow. From my... I can't see every comment. You know, it's the most wonderful thing about music, and it's also wonderful, I think, the cello community. Maybe we're a little bit special. I don't know what it is about cellists, but uh, we hang together, right? Um, so there really is a sense of cello community, and I think, I mean, my goal with Cello Bello is to increase that so that so it's truly global. There's so much division between countries and cultures, and wow, to have people from everywhere uh, just joining in this chat, I can't tell you uh, how good I feel about that. And um, I hope everybody out there is feeling as I am that there's a real sense of community uh, that comes from these uh, get-togethers. Okay, there's an earlier question from Olivia Vaughn. I've been working on the second movement of Elgar Concerto and I'm struggling with the Sotia stroke. Ah. Any tips? <laughs> um, that's the kind of question that's very, very hard to talk about when I can't see your bow arm. Um, but uh, it depends.
depends. Uh, let's see what I can. If you're trying to bounce the bow, uh, and you're you're probably not, but some people do, and you notice that you're trying to bounce the bow, and you're using your whole arm, that's not going to work. If you're using your wrist. That's not the way I spiccato, so, um, but that might, uh, there's a lot of wonderful cellists that spiccato with their wrist. Um, and then there's another, a third spiccato, which is using your forearm. Uh, I have a big confession here. This is not a cello bow. That's why it's not working very well for me. <laughs> this is Peshan's viola bow. I picked up the wrong bow. <laughs> Peshan's not only a wonderful pianist, she plays the viola. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> I should have paid more attention to the... This is a cello bow. <laughs> it's too late. It's a... Anyway, this is a viola bow. I don't know how to make a viola bow bounce, but I can show you anyway. Forearm hinge. Like if you're, uh, this is on the string, and this should be off the string. So this is, I think, the best way to play the second movement of Elgar. Uh, you can go with this kind of stroke, with this kind of bounce. You can uh, choose your tempo. You can go a little bit faster, a little bit slower. With a wrist and fingers spiccato, you can get a really good spiccato, but most of the time you have to go quite fast for that to work. So if you don't want to play the movement too fast, uh, then your wrist, just using your wrist and fingers might be hard to coordinate if your left hand can't uh, keep up. And if you're trying to, to bounce the bow like this, now this works uh, for bouncing the bow in a slow tempo. That's how we bounce the bow, you know, in a, Mozart Symphony or a Haydn String Quartet, which cellists do a lot, we bounce the bow by a nice loose swing from the shoulder. Right? But as we get faster and faster, we need to go more into the forearm hinge. Um, next time I do a chat, I'll be sure I have a cello bow here so I can really show you. <laughs> How embarrassing. <laughs> Okay, there's a... Uh, re from Rebecca. Uh -huh. Hello, Mr. Katz. I'm, a struggling, I'm struggling with my vibrato. How do you recommend your students to reach an artistic vibrato speed? Oh. Well, uh, yeah, an artistic vibrato speed for me means how do you learn to vary your vibrato? Um, because, um, that's one kind of vibrato if the mood is very relaxed and peaceful, and that's another kind of vibrato if something is more dramatic, right? Um, so, oh, I love these questions, but they're so hard when I can't see your hand, so... Let me just give a little bit of general advice. Sorry, Rebecca, I can't be totally specific to you. If you, if you can see my left hand well, they're, they're, they're basically uh, cellists usually fall into two camps. There are great cellists that play with their hands squared like this. Pablo Casals was one of them. Uh, a lot of uh, European schooling uh, plays this way. I call this a squared off position because you see the way my little finger is It's sort of at right angles to the cello and then there's another way to play when your fingers are aligned more slanted angled right and those two vibratos are very different the motion is very different and a lot of people confuse them so if you Rebecca, you have to look at your hand and see if your hand is squared like this, then you would practice a rotational motion like this, right? which is the way a lot of 
maybe a hundred years ago, this is the way vibrato was always taught. Maybe more than that, I don't know. But that's a rotational vibrato. If you're, that doesn't work, however, if you're playing in a slanted position. In a slanted position, the vibrato is a motion that's parallel. I, I like to, uh, to teach it like this. And then anchor it. So it's basically a motion which is not rotational. It's a, it feels a little bit like you're pumping your forearm parallel to the cello, up and down. Um, so you might experiment with that, see, check out your hand position, and then try those different vibratos. Um, when I was a kid, my first teacher taught me to play the cello like this, uh, which is squared off. I played this way till I was about 17 years old, and I was always felt like a... Uh, that my vibrato sounded wobbly. So when I was a kid, I was always pushing my vibrato to make it go faster. Um, so uh, when I started studying with uh, Bernard Greenhouse, he suggested that I turn my hand, angle it, and immediately with no more tension in the hand, I had a faster pulsation. So generally speaking, if you're trying to get your vibrato faster, if you make sure your hand is angled and you practice a rotation, I mean, not a rotational, but a pumping motion coming out of this, uh, that might help your vibrato speed. If your vibrato is too fast and you're trying to slow it down, uh, turning your hand more squared off and thinking more of a rotational vibrato can help you slow it down. So when I'm teaching uh, my students, uh, I sometimes will suggest that they play, if their vibrato is too fast and it just won't quit all the time, uh, I, I will sometimes suggest they turn their hand this way and if, it, if they're pushing the vibrato and can't get fast enough, I'll try it this way. One more thing. I always have long-winded answers, but everything is so interconnected. Um, I see a lot of people do this. They play this way in the lower positions, and then when they go up in the thumb position, they go into an angled position. So uh, Janusz Starker was really big on insisting that, it, that we play with one angle up and down the cello. That is so helpful. It makes your shifts much more consistent. You don't miss as much as when you're turning your angle during your shift, but it also makes your vibrato consistent. So if you are playing squared off like that, when you go up here, you want to stay squared off and you come down and you keep your angle the same. If you're slanted here, then when you go up, you want to keep your angle the same. So you can, these are the best things to practice now while we're sort of in the house. No concerts coming up, uh, don't have that kind of pressure. You can experiment with these kinds of things. They're so important to mastering the instrument. They seem like, like small details, but those little small details make all the difference in the world in terms of comfort and ultimately sound and I think even though I talked so long, I can't remember the question. I think the question had to do with an artistic vibrato, and that's what's going to give you uh, a variety of uh, widths and speeds. Another Cello Bello plug. On the website, um, vibrato is probably the topic that I've covered the most. You know, for all the lessons that I have up there, there's still plenty of pedagogical holes, uh, uh, you know, videos I haven't had an opportunity to make yet. But vibrato, I think I have five or six different uh, vibrato videos up there. They all relate to each other. Um, so if you go to the website, cellobello.org, don't, don't look at, don't, don't watch the same video on YouTube. Uh, it doesn't give you as much information. Go to cellobello.org. Uh, do the pull down menu on find left hand and you'll find all your vibrato videos 
And what, what you find there is, besides the video, I have text that I've written, supplementary text to help explain the video better. And I have uh, more on the same topic. So after you've watched the video, you can look down on the website and see uh, one of my colleagues has written a blog on vibrato that might be useful, um, or it will take you to another vibrato uh, video, or there might even be something in Cello Legacy where Greenhouse or Starker or somebody is talking about vibrato. So I try and pull all of that together on the website, and um, it's a great time while you're home now, uh, and you've got the time to watch those. At least I hope that they're useful. Yeah. By the way, Rebecca is in Sweden. Sweden? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Oh. Okay. I love Stockholm. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite cities. <laughs> uh, so there are many questions. Okay. okay. Uh, this one is actually from Heather Lander from Australia. Oh, hi Heather. <laughs> Firstly, I'm so thankful for Cello Bell and the resources they provide. I'm particularly interested in hearing about what you believe the priorities in setting up beginners. Oh, well that's kind of interesting. Um, I was lucky. I, when I started, you know, when I was uh, seven years old, my teacher was I mean, he was just somebody in the neighborhood. He wasn't uh, a great artist or anything such as that. But, and there was, <laughs> looking back on it, there was so much he didn't know. But I was, I am really blessed because the one thing that he cared about was not letting me be tight. Um, I think tightness at the instrument, and every little kid, tends to be tight because they're not big and they're not strong and it's kind of hard to hold this thing and it's even for a little kid it's pretty hard to get the strings down too. All of those things are tension producing but if you can teach uh, kids right from the beginning um, you know to to hang their arm on the instrument not to squeeze not to get the ch the string down by squeezing their thumb and finger together, which makes the whole arm tight. And we talked enough about resting and, and breathing. Just so, even if they're a little bit sloppy and don't hold the bow maybe the best, or their hand position is not ideal, if they get used to playing the instrument uh, just a little bit like this, um, as they get older, um, they will discipline, their, their cello technique will become more and more refined and everything is possible. But the hardest thing on the instrument to undo is tension. You know, it's not so hard to fix a hand position or the way you sit at the instrument or anything like that, but it's really hard if you've played for five or eight or ten years like this, it's really hard to let go of that. So I think that's the most important thing. Let me say one other thing. I hope I'm not speaking too soon, but because of uh, the fact that the whole world is bottled up in homes and apartments now and schools all over the world have closed and kids are home, um, we're trying to start on Cello Bello, um, whether we'll call it Cello Kids or Cello Children or something such as that. We're trying to get that up and running in the next week because there's, you know, a whole universe of kids, six to 11 years old, that play cello, take cello lessons. Not everybody's going to be able to get to a teacher. Parents aren't going to be able to afford to keep going with lessons when they're unemployed. I mean, it's just the whole world is a nightmare right now. So if we can start some online kids uh, lessons for children uh, we're doing that and we're working on it right now and i hope you'll see it within the next week or so um we've never cello bello is you know when i started it i always thought of it as basically for junior high all the way up through young artists but i never really tried to do anything for children i think that's another universe uh but we're going to try and have some web pages that have some graphics and kid-friendly uh, uh, images and some teachers that specialize in young children. So 
cat's out of the bag. I hope we're successful. Keep watching for it. <laughs> okay, there's a question from YouTube Live. How would one practice bow distribution? Oh, bow distribution. Tune in tomorrow. Did you see Norman Fisher is giving tomorrow's cello chat? And I can't remember the name of it exactly, but it has to do with bow distribution, I'm sure it does, whatever, maybe somebody will be able to read that. Um, so, um, Norman is a dear friend, he's a most entertaining and most wonderful cellist, and I'm going to tune in myself and see what he's got to say. I bow distribution is one of the most difficult things to, to teach, and it's one of the most important parts of being an artist. Because when you've got three notes and one note, then the one note sticks out, and that can ruin a phrase. Um, if you're trying to play fast and you're in the wrong part of the bow, it's really hard to coordinate. So just getting out in the middle of the bow all, all, all of a sudden can make a, a fast passage comfortable. So um, if you're trying to play loud and you're too far out here, you have to work a lot harder. So when you uh, want power, you want to be in near the frog and keep bringing yourself back to the frog whenever it's practical. So where your arm weight and your uh, and gravity helps you make a big sound. Uh, when you want to play soft, on the other hand, uh, being out here at the tip uh, could be the answer. So bow distribution is critical to dynamics, it's critical to phrase shape, it's critical to mood because it has a lot to do with whether you're playing with air or you're playing deep in the cello. Um, and the other thing which I think is pretty universally true, I don't know why, but or maybe I do know why, you know, 95% of us are just focused on the left hand all of the time. We're, we want to play in tune, we're thinking about the notes. So in terms of where our brain is, this, the bow arm, which makes the sound, makes the artistry, makes the mood, makes the projection, does everything, um, it's forgotten about. So I, I think it's a wonderful question. Um, bow distribution is basically synonymous with the art of playing the instrument. And I could quote one of my uh, most quotable teachers, that's Gregor Piotrgorsky, who always would say, the left hand are your thoughts, the right hand is your tongue. So uh, I love that imagery. These are thoughts. Without the bow, they're thoughts. <laughs> and they can't, they don't communicate by themselves. This is your tongue, this is what you speak with, this is basically what you make music with. It's not quite that simple, of course, the sort of shift, the slide that you put in, or whether it's a fast or a slow vibrato, those things come into it, but 90% of artistry and 90% of communication is from here. So, yes, bow distribution. Listen to Norman tomorrow. <laughs> There's a question that I missed from much earlier uh, from Nathaniel. I've seen a form of trill which basically combines trilling and vibrato in one motion. Do you have any advice for achieving this motion? Uh huh. Yeah. So, trills, uh, another great topic. So, this has to do with there's different techniques on how you lift the finger. So, one way to lift the finger, again, if you can see it, I'm just lifting the finger straight from my knuckle, up and down from my knuckle, right? And that, on the face of it, looks very efficient, and but it's actually not what I suggest. I think that, uh, and again, I just, oh. Can you maybe move, do I need move, to, swing move to your right more? Move to my right? Yeah, so you oh. turn the cello. No, turn the cello over. This way? Yes. Oh, okay. How's that? Yeah, better. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Peshawn. Yeah. 
So um, both, uh, just so that you believe me, I have to do some name dropping. Both uh, Bernard Greenhouse and Janusz Starker taught me this and uh, it, it helped so tremendously. Rather than play just from your knuckles like this, if in addition to lifting your finger, you can you see my forearm rotating now? So that I lift my finger by rotating my arm back. So everybody that's watching me, if you just take your left hand and hold it in the air and just flip, flip your finger, like don't turn it up and down, but just throw it. It's a reflex and you can throw your hand down and it'll re rebound back up. It's like opening a door or closing a door. I'm not sure which it is, <laughs> but you throw it down and let it flip back up. So that reflex of just tossing it makes your finger very strong. And the point of that reflex is that it replaced muscle. So you don't have to work in any way to get the string down. That reflex is so powerful that that, that that combined lift of finger and rotation um, can keep your trills very loose. Actually, I use it in all playing. So um, if you can see my forearm, there's some freedom and rotation in it. I'm not just playing. I'm not just playing from the knuckles itself. Um, so the question had to do with trills that uh, look like vibrato. There is such a thing called a vibrato trill, which is sort of a negative. <laughs> uh, if you just, uh, if you're thinking of vibrato being rotational and you're just turning your forearm, you get something like that. I can't do it very well. But if you're lifting your finger at the same time, so it may look like a vibrato, may look like vibrato and it's related to vibrato in some ways, but it's not related to this vibrato. You know, to go back to the earlier question, it's, it's related to the rotational vibrato. Um, but it's important to combine both. You want to be, uh, and always keep in mind that the a little more height and looseness and speed replaces the need for muscle. So if you feel like you're putting your finger down and you're using muscle to put your finger down, that's a labored trill and it will never be free. But if you can get into a flutter feeling, that should that bird wing feeling, that little flutter that you get from doing this in the air that will give you a good trill. Um, it's five minutes after two, but there oh. are still many questions. So oh, I'll go a like little longer that? if uh, people are up for it. Sure. I mean, we got nothing but time these days, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. How do you practice slur staccato and brush strokes? Uh, a staccato? Slur staccato, you know, like this. I, I, maybe an upbow staccato, is that what they... Uh, whoever wrote the question, maybe clarify what you mean by slurred staccato. Uh, it could be that. It could be the slur over dot. Uh-huh, yeah. So, okay, actually both of those, whether it's fast or slow, are essentially the same, so okay. I'll, I'll try and answer that. So if you take a legato sound and you want to, I think of that as a kind of a pressure and release from the index finger on the bow. And what I, people that have trouble doing that usually means that they're always tight. So if you, if you don't, if you don't, if you play that and you don't release, now it's hard to make the next, how do you make the next one? So after you, if you release, then you can re reapply. So I, I hope that that's 
what you mean uh, when you're asking about, uh, I guess, staccato under a slur. Now beyond that, you know, the kind of staccato that we do under a slur, you want to think a lot about what's the character. Because if something's expressive, so that's a much more gentle uh, kind of legato pulsation where the bow keeps moving. And if you can see my index finger, release, 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 release. Um, if you want a dramatic or a sharp character, you might stop the bow between each note. In both cases, it's pressure release, pressure release. But, so think about the, the mood or the character of the piece, and then you can practice that longer or shorter, um, kill the sound or let the sound resonate. You can have an infinite variety of how you do that stroke depending on what you're trying to express. So this question is about intonation and tuning. How should the cello be tuned when playing with only a piano, like equal temperament tune, uh -huh. or when it's playing with other string instruments? Okay, so I think one of the great things about these cello chats is that you will probably find some different opinions. Um, and I love that myself. I love to watch my colleagues and uh, get stimulating ideas and some of them I don't agree with, um, but sometimes it's just more than one way to do something successfully. Uh, for me, I don't like to mess around with more than one way to tune the cello. I find for myself, if I try and tune the cello one way for piano and another way for a string quartet and another way for a Bach suite, starts to drive me crazy and my left hand feels sometimes like uh, doesn't know the instrument so well. So um, what I think works for everything actually is the way a piano tuner tunes the piano. You know, uh, a piano tuner might take an A440 or an A442 or whatever it is and then the piano tuner goes around the circle of fifths. So after an A, he will tune a D. From a D, he will tune a C, a G. From a G, he will tune a C, just like we tune the cello. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> From a C, he will tune an F. We don't have an F string. From an F, he'll go to a B flat. Um, so one of the kind of oddities of nature is if you take that perfect fifth, a mathematically perfect fifth, so um, scientifically, mathematically perfect fifth, and you tune each fifth like that all the way around the circle of fifths, when you finally get back to A, you will be a quarter of, a quarter of a tone off. Um, I don't remember how many cents that is. I think it's like 20 cents, something like that. It might be 24 cents. Um, but you will, the Hans Jensen book, Cello Mind, will explain this all to you scientifically. <laughs> um, but so what piano tuners do is they squeeze each one of those fifths just a little bit, one or two cents, just one or two vibrations closer. So when you take your A and you tune your D, you tune it instead of a perfect fifth, just a little bit closer. Then you tune the G just a little bit closer. So when you do that, and let's talk about piano intonation first. When you do that, your C, when you get down to the C, your C will be in tune with the C of the piano because that's how the piano tuner tuned, right? He was squeezing them also. Um, and the other part about uh, piano intonation, if we talk about piano, is that pianists can't do what we do. 
In other words, we can play a B a little bit lower here and then a little bit higher here. Maybe mm -hmm. it's that third we were talking about uh, in first position to get a just tuning, or maybe it's a leading tone B a little closer to a C. String players, we have this luxury, or um, it's maybe a mixed blessing, <laughs> of being able to adjust notes for different keys and different contexts. A pianist has to have the can only has to play in all keys, major and minor, all chords, and sound in tune. So that's what uh, tempered tuning is. That's uh, so. If you listen to a piano very carefully, and you hear a major third on a piano, it's not really in tune, but it's close enough um, that it's acceptable to the ear. So the way I think of it is if we tune, like a pianist, tune our D a little bit sharp, our G a little bit sharp, our C a little bit sharp, that C will be in tune with the piano. Um, but these four notes are immovable for us. Everything else on the cello is movable. But so we've done the same thing by doing that. We've made these four strings fit the greatest variety of situations. It's true in very advanced playing. We sometimes need to play a little bit out of tune with our strings because they won't move. But 90%, 95% of the time, we just play in tune with our open strings and they're in a fixed position that fits all keys. That's really helpful for playing in a string quartet. As somebody who spent their career in a quartet, I can tell you when the strings are tuned a little bit sharp, um, it makes chords much easier for a quartet. It's, um, if you take a low C of a cello, and an E string of a violin, they're, you, they can be terribly out of tune with each other unless you've squeezed your fifths together. And one last thing about that, um, the electronic tuners will help you with that because all the electronic tuners also squeeze, I mean, actually, sometimes you can adjust a tuner. You have a choice of what kind of tuning you want, but the, the basic models, the standard tuning, is they tune like a piano, they squeeze the fifths for you. So if you take an A440 and then tune your D, G, and C to it, you will be in effect squeezing the fifths. Terribly complicated subject. Uh, I hope that's useful. Like I said earlier, I, I can talk about, I, I have this lecture that I give on intonation, which takes over an hour and a half. So that's the, the short, quick version. Okay. Uh... There are many questions about repertoire, like you know, different concertos, and do you want to pick one? Um, why don't we go? Should we? Uh, I actually have a cello bello staff meeting a little later today, but if we go, maybe if we go till uh, till that thirty minutes after, how much more time do we have? Fifteen more minutes. We go another fifteen minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Uh, so this is. From Yongju Cho, uh -huh. Yongju Cho. Hi, Mr. Katz. I'm currently working on the first movement of the Dvorak Cello Concerto. Any tips on how to change the colors throughout the movement, and how would you practice the octaves and chords? <laughs> wow. Well, I have to be in shape so I can demonstrate. I haven't played the cello for a while. I'm trying to set up cello chats on cello bello and <laughs> all this. <coughs> but the first part of your question, how do you change colors? The same as you change colors in any piece in the world. What is a color? How do you, how do you change a color? You have weight or pressure. <laughs> Actually, let me try and do it at the same volume. Uh, completely different sounds, if you can hear that uh, on a, uh, over a computer. Uh, this is a much more floaty sound. This is a, 
a deeper sound, but in the room here, they're the same volume, so, but they're different colors. So you decide, do I want a floaty sound? Do I want a deep sound? Um, then you decide, is this a relaxed mo mo uh, moment? So I'm purposely keeping my vibrato slow instead of, which doesn't really fit the mood. If you, it's too fast, it makes the music sound very intense. So if you learn about the tools, the physical tools that your hands have at their disposal to change mood, then you work with those. So there's a lot of that on the Cello Bello website. All the differences about wide vibrato and narrow vibrato and fast vibrato and slow vibrato and floating the bow fast bows and slow bows, contact points near the bridge, contact points. Uh, so to go back to one of the, since we're going talking about practicing today too, um, I think one of the most important ways to practice well is to be experimental. Um, and so I think a lot of a lot of students. It's kind of natural. You have your weekly cello lesson. You get an assignment. You go home. You are practicing, and you're not getting the sound you want. So you think, at least subconsciously, oh, uh, my teacher will help me with that next week, right? Or uh, I'll ask Miss So and So or Mr. So and So uh, how to do that, right? Um, but maybe that's not so possible now. Of being cut off the way we are. Um, so in, I, I think people should always be experimental, but this is really the time to be experimental. Be creative, you know. Do anything to get the sound that you're looking for um, because you don't have somebody to ask. And you'd be amazed how much information you have inside of yourself if you just stop and think and be, you know, self-teach, be your own teacher. I think that could be one of the most valuable things to take away uh, from all this isolation uh, that we're facing now. So um, if you're playing Dvorak Concerto or any other piece and you want to make a particular color and you don't know how, well, invent, you know. Uh, Try a faster bow, a slower bow, try a different kind of vibrato, even try slanting your hand in a different position. Um, uh, try playing the passage on a different string. Maybe it, you'll get a color that you like better on the D string instead of the A string. So creativity, imagination, experimentation, um, that's what's gonna take you to your colors in the Dvorak Concerto. Um, and another sort of related thought is practicing the cello uh, doesn't just mean learning the notes. Actually, practicing the cello means um, uh, developing your creativity, developing your imagination. You actually want to think about that. Uh, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm sitting here and I don't know what to do. It's so frustrating. Well, that's where you want your imagination to kick in. Um, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to solve every problem, but uh, um, again, Piatigorsky used to talk about the fact, he says, you have a goal to learn this piece and it's the top of this mountain and you're down at the bottom of the mountain and you want to get up here. He says, so there's a whole bunch of paths. You don't know which one's going to get you to the top of the mountain. So. You start up the mountain and maybe you hit a dead end and you got to come back down and try again, but then you get so far up the mountain and then you make a left turn and it'll get you someplace else. And eventually, through trial and error, it's like going through a maze, you get to the top of the mountain. That's imagination, that's experimentation. So that takes you further than any cello lesson in the long run. Well, there are people from Algeria. go faster, go faster. <laughs> there are people from Algeria, Belgium, Mexico. Oh my God! And uh, 
this is a question from Hungary, Budapest. Wow. Uh, from Aaron. Can you suggest a way to practice Prokofiev Symphonia Concertano's second movement, the part that's right after the cadenza? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's tough. That's that's really tough. Yeah, so um, you need to think about how you cross strings. Um, I think since you're going from A string to G string and back and forth again, don't try and do it just with your wrist. You need to have some arm motion that's taking you up and down the cello. Um, there's also a lot of double up bows in that particular passage. A lot of people may not know what we're talking about, so I, but I, I think I can give you some quick pointers. Uh, so, beat up, 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 um, those kind of double ups. Um, if your hand is loose enough and your wrist is loose enough, you, depending on how fast you're going, you'll be able to do those double ups. But if that's hard for you, try unhooking. Uh, I think Rostopovich put double up bows in there, uh, two dots with the slur over it. But you could actually play those just separate bows also, and uh, that might help you yeah, in that area. And the uh, other thing is not to leave all your fingers down, but keep releasing your fingers as you go through that passage so that your hand doesn't get tied up. Hope that helps. <laughs> yes. Uh, so this, this is from Emma, Emma Fisher. Do you oh, know I know Emma. Hi, Emma. Emma lives in Canada. <laughs> uh, how do you move the bow from different contact points if you have little time to do so? For example, in Piatti, number 12, the chords and the staccato. Oh, so um, is, what is number 12? Uh, is that number 12? <laughs> I think it is, yes. Um, yeah. I don't think you want to have a contact point that varies too much. So uh, I hope I'm on the right Piatti Caprice. Uh, I think it's the up bow staccatos followed by chords. Um, and if, if that's the case, the, that stroke and, and, the, and the, the chords themselves can be almost in the same place. You don't want to try jumping up and down too much. Um, maybe you, in fact, I think there's a lot of flair in the chords if you use quick bows, yump, bump, bump, beam. So there's a lot of visual flair and freedom, which means you can play the chords maybe a little further away from the bridge and you can find a common contact point for, uh, for the, the two different techniques. Uh, one more? Mm -hmm. One more question. Uh, could you explain how to do the bow motion spiccato that is required in the second movement of Sanson's cello concerto going between the A and D string, the little cadenza section? Yes. Okay, so again, I can't bounce the bow with a viola bow very well. But um, I would practice just making an accelerando without the left hand moving. So, and when you start, if you watch, uh, my whole arm is swinging. And my fingers right here, because I've got control of my stick, my fingers are controlling every drop. So I'm not doing... So now I'm swinging my arm, but I'm not controlling the drop with my fingers. And then... And you get faster and faster. As you get faster and faster, this keeps swinging but it gets smaller and smaller, and you feel it being controlled more and more from the hand. Um, 
After you can make a really nice accelerando and retard uh, without moving your left hand, uh, then you can start combining it. And when and what you want to listen to there is put your ear on that shift note. It'll help you coordinate it and help keep it in tune. So you want to hear that. Uh, chromatic going down the A string. Hope that helps. <laughs> uh -huh. um, this is from Courtney. I think your former student. Oh, Courtney? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Hi, Court. How are you? <laughs> do you have <laughs> it's been a... 10 years. <laughs> uh, do you have a few tips for students that are developing their intonation ability to place correctly on the fingerboard? Place their hands correctly on the fingerboard? Fingers, yeah. Um, well, hand position is related to intonation, that's, that's for sure. Um, uh, not exactly sure what the question uh, means. I think, you know, the, maybe a basic hand position for a kid is to be round. Um, Little hands, well, big hands too. Every hand is stronger like this than like this. You know, when your fingers are hitting like this, they're weak. So, you know, we all learn in our geometry class that uh, the arch is, is the, you know, the strongest shape. So to have the fingers, they don't have, not the fingertips so much, but just to have a circle here to feel your palm right here. I think it's really nice to, for adults too, but to tell kids to feel a connection right here so that the, the, your palm feels soft, but that that's where your power is coming from. I think that can be helpful. And I think one of the biggest things you can, most important things you can teach kids is not to get the not to get the string down by squeezing with the thumb. So I like uh, to think of hanging my arm weight. Oh, this is so hard. I hope you can see it. But if you hang your arm weight here, my the A string is completely down, but my thumb is soft back here. It's not squeezing up. Um, so it's not pinching. That's a hard habit to overcome. So the idea that uh, you think of your finger as a hook and you just hang your arm on it. And it's round here so it has strength. So a lot of times I tell kids to hang their arm and so they start, then they get way down too low like this because they're trying to hang. So you have to make that hook first and in order to feel the hang, sense of hanging, you don't have to be way down here. You can still have a normal elbow height, right? But that also helps keep your shoulder down uh, when you think of hanging so that you don't start hunching up like this. Hope that helps. <laughs> okay. Do you want to take one more? Or? Okay, last question. Okay. And then everybody that didn't get their question in, come back tomorrow and ask Norman Fisher. <laughs> okay. uh, your thoughts uh, on learning plateaued? Do you believe that's valid or is it just an urban myth? What are your thoughts and opinions on why it occurs? What are the general specific ways to address learning plateaus as one progresses from a beginner to intermediate to early advanced, etc.? Oh, okay. I was thinking of learning plateaus in a little bit different uh, sense is uh, and that might this might be useful for today's theme also that um, I think of of you know we talked about goals at the beginning and having a goal in your practicing so a goal usually means that you have something up in your head something in your inner ear that you would love to sound like that. Maybe it's your intonation, maybe it's the uh, 
the way you imagine the Dvorak concerto to sound, whatever it is, you have this concept up here. That's the most important thing about learning. You have to have some idea up here what you want to sound like. Uh, and sometimes people will say, oh, I know it doesn't sound very good, but I'm not sure what to do about it. Well, that usually means that your conception is a little bit weak. Um, so you want to think about what do I, what, what do I want to, you know, what mood do I, what mood do I really want? Um, how am I going to get that? Let's try and strengthen your conception a little bit. But then what happens in practicing, we have this kind of goal, this, and it's up in our head, and we work towards it, and we get better and better at it, and we might even reach it, right? And then we feel pretty good. Wow. Yeah. Um, man, I'm really playing the cello great, you know? That's really important. That's a great place to be. And then there's, so I call that a plateau. And then you keep playing, and then I'll have students come in for a lesson and say, Oh, Mr. Katz, I played so much better two weeks ago. I'm sounding worse and worse. So that's usually not true. That's usually not the case. So what's happened is up in the head, your conception of what you want to sound like, your goals, your ideals of what you want to be, has grown. You're at a little higher level. And so you're down here where you used to be satisfied, but now that doesn't satisfy you anymore. So now you have something higher to struggle for to try and reach. So I call that learning plateaus. Um, and so um, I think it's more than psychology. Uh, sometimes when my students come in and they're terribly frustrated, I'll tell them, well, that's a good sign. <laughs> But, and I really mean it too. To be frustrated, of course, is not fun, but sometimes when you're frustrated, it means you're about to make some real progress because you're looking for something maybe that you weren't looking for before, or looking for something that you didn't hear before. And so sometimes when we're most frustrated, we're about to make our, our most progress. And when we feel best about ourselves, that's a time where where we're at and what we want to sound like have sort of come together. Um, so that's what I call plateaus. Um, I'm not sure, yes, sure, there's uh, the other sense of plateaus, beginner, intermediate, uh, advanced, young artist, mature artist. I mean, all of that flows to thought about it too much. I hope I'm not, it doesn't feel to me like people that were advising me of it, about who am I targeting the website? Who, who are the lessons for? Um, and what I really believe is that all the foundational stuff, how we hold the bow, the, the fundamentals of good shifting, how we vibrate, all of those things, um, you can learn them at different levels of development so that a 12 year old looking at a vibrato exercise hopefully finds it useful and a 24 year old young artist looking at the same vibrato exercise can also find it useful at a much higher level. Um, but it's like, um, oh, I don't know. I always talk about, uh, a, Tiger Woods, who was a great golfer, he was a superstar, and um, he'd already won some uh, major tournaments, and he actually left a competitive golf for a year because he wanted to fix something fundamental in his swing, and then he came back even at a higher level. So wherever you are in the developmental curve, you want to always come back to the basics. Um, and don't ever think that man, I can play Symphonia Concertante, so I really don't need to think about how I'm holding the bow or how I'm shifting or is there a better way to sit. All those kinds of foundational things, if you think about them throughout your entire life and as you progress from one stage to the next, you come back and you just master them at a higher level. This has been a great chat. I've enjoyed myself. Um, I'm so happy we're able to do this every day. 
I hope I'll be back in a week or 10 days or something like that. I want to give all my colleagues uh, out there around the world, actually, if anybody that's watching now that uh, has a cello teacher that they admire or an artist that they think might want to come on and do a chat, have them write to me. Um, I want to do as many chats as possible. I want to keep you all occupied during this, uh, this time. And um, I hope you all feel uh, that this has been useful and uh, maybe a little bit of bonding, huh? Um, wash your hands, keep the dirt off the bow hair, uh, stay away from the virus. Please, please uh, respect social distancing. We're all in this together. It's not a funny business right now. Nobody is immune and uh, even people that don't get it can pass it along. So, um, and use the cello to feel good um, and see you all soon. Thank you very much.